Canada just saw the largest foreign investor sell off in history. So is the Canadian dollar just resting on a knife's edge right now? Well, we're going to get into that and go through what exactly is going on. So this was put out on Better Dwelling. I think it's an excellent article. And uh, yeah, you're not going to believe it. So if you look at this chart, you can see this goes all the way back to 1995. And you would struggle to find an outflow that is similar to the one that we're experiencing right now now, maybe back in 2008 and around the financial crisis. But this actually looks like a way worse situation. And it's actually staying down there even longer. So this is kind of crazy. And you can see what this is net international purchases of Canadian equities. So anyway, let's see what they're saying here. So Canada's stock market underperformed, failing to attract investors. Canada's largest stock market has noticeably lagged, especially when compared to the US. BMO's research shows that the TSX climbed just 8.1% in 2023 compared to the S&P 500's 24.2% over the same period. Some of this can be attributed to retracting the lost ground in 2022, but not all of it. Significant selling was observed and it isn't exactly clear why. So it's very interesting. And when you get into the data, it just gets even more terrible for Canada. So Canada has never seen such a foreign investor sell-off. Canada is typically seen as a safe haven for investors, but some of that sheen has begun to tarnish. Foreign investors sold a net $48.7 billion worth of Canadian equities in 2023. That number doesn't just sound astronomical. It would have been unimaginable in 2019. It's the largest annual outflow on record ever for Canada. Wow. So do you think that this is some of the smart money that sees what's coming that isn't emotionally attached to Canada like most Canadians and just sees it for what it is and thinks, wow, this is looking insanely risky. You've got an economy that is extremely leveraged, public debt, private debt, household debt. And they're just looking at this and thinking it looks a little bit risky. The housing market looks like a bubble. The banking system looks a little bit fragile. And I just want to go over to this because this will make you laugh. Royal Bank of Canada, most popular among retail investors who own 51% of the shares, institutions hold 48%. So when you think about who is propping up the banks and the financial institutions in Canada, believe it or not, it's actually a retail investor investor drive. So this is not good in my opinion. And it kind of shows how the bubble is just literally reliant on itself almost. You've got a lot of these people who have concentrated their net worth in household debt also going along the banks and financial institutions as well. I mean, it's literally like, yeah, let's just put even more of our net worth into this pyramid scheme. It's kind of crazy, but I thought I'd mention that because it's incredibly interesting when we're talking about foreign investor sell-off. Over the past three decades, a normal year would have seen net buying of about 12 billion, an inflow of about 1 billion a month. Not the outflow of 4 billion per month seen in 2023, says Porter, emphasizing how unusual this trend is. Is that really unusual to us on this channel? Considering the developments in the Canadian economy over the past 12 months and all the things that we've discussed on this channel, if you've been keeping your ear close to this channel, you'll know the labor market is deteriorating. Canada is already in a recession, despite what the government statistics is saying. We're heading in to potentially a depression. The immigration bubble, the housing bubble, the private debt bubble, the credit bubble, and the government debt bubble. So there's so many bubbles. It's almost the everything bubble in Canada, the super bubble, where now the debt surpasses even the amount of output that the country produces. So obviously, it doesn't take somebody who's very smart to work out, hang on a second, Luke, if we owe more than we produce, how on earth are we going to pay that back? Precisely, you're not going to pay that back. <laughs> That's why I don't have any of my net worth here in Canada anymore, because quite frankly, I think it is a disaster long term, especially to hold Canadian dollars. I think that people, this isn't financial advice, should be saving in US dollars, not Canadian dollars, because again, I think the economic prospects for Canada are much worse than the United States, considering the bubble that we're in in all these different areas. Weak foreign investment has been weakening the loonie. The heavy 
reselling by foreign investors explains the issue, but it's hardly surprising. This is part of a larger trend of investors abroad pulling back on capital invested in the country. Foreign direct investment being another glaring red flag. But when you look at countries like Mexico, they're experiencing record growth of foreign capital being invested in their country. So it's obviously not just due to foreign investors pulling back. I mean, that is going to be part of it when you've got what's happening in China, what's happening in Canada, what's happening in Europe, what's happening in the United States, what's happening in the global economy, what's happening in Japan. We've got multiple countries in recession right now. I mean, yeah, it's a time to pull back. So combined with a steady net outflow in FDI, this helps explain why the Canadian dollar has struggled over the past year. Indeed, the surprise is that it didn't suffer an even bigger setback. And you guys will know that I've said this too. I've said that actually, I think the Canadian dollar is overvalued when you really look at it. Because if you look at the declines relative to other countries like the UK, the euro, the Canadian dollar is actually held up pretty well. So it could be due a large correction. But it's very hard to predict Forex markets, obviously. But a lot of the Forex markets up and down movements are to do with capital flows. And if you've got a lot of capital that is leaving your country, selling investments in Canada, converting to other currencies, what you're going to have happen and the predominant currency that people are going to convert to is what? US dollars, despite what people tell you about the US dollar collapsing. So annual data isn't available for Canadian FDI yet, but for the past year, it wasn't pretty. Canadians sent nearly 9 billion more abroad than foreign investors sent to Canada in Q3 alone. It's generally not a good sign when domestic investors see more opportunities abroad than foreign investors see in a country. Guys, you only have to think about this in terms of the housing bubble for starters. It's not a productive investment to invest in housing in Canada. It's not a productive investment to invest in businesses in Canada when people are this much in debt. I mean, if you're looking to start a business in Canada, you're going to be looking at the consumer and thinking, does the consumer have a lot of income to spare to pay for my goods and services? And the answer is hell no in Canada. So why on earth are you going to start a business here? And like I said, there are other places where you can start a business that aren't suffering like Canada is. There are other countries in recession. There are countries that are going to suffer as bad like Australia. But the reality is, and maybe we should do a comparison, if Australia and New Zealand are actually seeing a similar thing to this. So yeah, when you've got domestic investors looking outside the country, it's not a good sign, is it? It's what you would expect considering what's happening in Canada. So next, I want to get into this because once again, it's just another dire statistic for the Canadian economy. So basically, Canadian business continue to contract as closures outpace startups. Canada is proving that a massive population boom doesn't always mean a booming economy. Statistics Canada data shows that the number of active businesses slipped lower in November. A lot more businesses have been shuttering their doors recently and fewer entrepreneurs are interested in replacing them. Canadians are pulling back on the number of businesses they operate in the country. Active businesses fell 932,000 falling 0.1% from the previous month. It was the third consecutive month decline. And then if you look on a chart, this is what it looks like. So you had the boom, which you would expect after 2021. It happened with a lag. It peaked out January 2023. And now it's starting to come down. And you've obviously got a lot of business bankruptcies that are happening as well in Canada, which again, just is not a good sign for the overall economy. And it talks about that right here. It says businesses are closing and no one wants to replace them. The net balance saw 4,000 businesses closed and open in November. It was the largest contraction since March 2023 and the biggest November on record, an issue that is likely to get worse with only five of the past 12 months seeing more businesses open than closed. And again, guys, it goes back to what I said. Is it productive to start a business in Canada? If you're a global investor, which I think we all have to be in a global economy, don't just look at where you are domestically in Canada. Look at places around the world where you could potentially invest, start a business that might be way more productive. And when you zoom out and look around, there's no chance. There's absolutely no chance that you would want to start a business in Canada if you know anything about the Canadian economy. So it's really, really sad that it's come to that. But again, this is the result of 
just two decades worth of building up of debt. You're not going to be able to change that just by replacing the government in a couple of years. And don't let anybody fool you that they're going to come in and, and change that. And I want to show you this as well, because this is just mind blowing. I saw this on Twitter. You guys have to see this. So public sector employees as a percentage of total employees, 1976 to 2024. So basically, it shows Canada, UK and the United States there. And you can see what's happened. And this chart, it goes from the 1970s all the way to 2024 on the right here. And you can basically see that Canada has over 20% of employees in the public sector compared to around probably 17% in the UK and less than 15% in the United States. And look at how this has grown. What's really interesting is the growth. You saw it absolutely explode in 2020, which again, you would expect with the cover up of the economy collapsing. Yes, we need to essentially create more public sector jobs, just pulling an Argentina essentially, grow the public sector, don't grow the economy. And what that does is actually hinder the economy even more because it means more bureaucracy and everything that goes along with more public sector jobs. Public sector jobs just aren't productive. They don't produce goods and services. They lead to more and more inflation. And it's just ridiculous. But this is what Wower is highlighting here. And you can see it. So basically, you can see how it shot up. It came back down slightly. And then boom, we're nearly back up at the highs right now. And you can see that it hasn't been like this since actually 1990-94 and all the way before that. But you can even see from around 2008, it's pretty much steadily held at 20%, which has been way more than the UK and way more than the United States. So there is just an insane amount of public sector employees as a percentage of total employees in Canada. So it is absolutely crazy. So anyway, if you are looking for another video to watch, check out this video or the video in the pinned comment. If you're looking for a VPN to get around Trudeau's censorship laws, Trudeau's online safety bill, Bill C-11, go to expressvpn.com forward slash market mania. I will see you in the next one.